It is true that Celsus said that there were lots of prophets in Palestine who said, I am a god or a son of God or a divine spirit and I have come. So Simon as the great power, what we know from Acts is that it's associated with the works of the Magus, a bunch of magicians who uh, try to exercise a demon and the demon ends up overpowering them and stripping them so that they run out naked. And then they burn a bunch of magical books. The, the portrait of Simon develops so that basically he becomes more and more looking like a legend. He's like the, the great magician and arch enemy of, of Christianity. He can kill people and sort of resurrect them, perform magic like making animals talk. He has a little boy do prophecies for him and make all the pots and pans cook a meal and, and things like that. But when Peter refers to the thought of your heart, it's apenia cardias. Helen referred to Simon's divine thought, sort of like Athena coming out of the head of Zeus. She is called Apenia or Enia, which is the Greek word for thought. Bang their countryman Simon, Magus, whom they say is God above all rule, authority, and power. God raises a Christ and seats him at the right hand in heaven above all rule, authority, and powers. We actually have evidence of this statue because in 1574, the base of it was discovered. And to everyone's surprise, it didn't read to Simon Sacred God. It read Simoni Senko Video Sacrum, which means dedicated to the trusty Simo Sankas. He is actually a, a, a native Italic god, Zeus-like character. So uh, he had a temple, or he his statue was nearby the temple of, of Jupiter, and specifically the Jupiter to whom you swore oaths to. Uh, some said that he was the son of Jupiter, so that's why he looked a little bit like Heracles. And welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And returning is someone who needs no introduction. He is uh, well attested on this channel, that's for sure. The great sage, Dr. M. David Litwa. And today we have a topic that is one of my favorites. We already did a video touching on this particular person, Simon of Samaria, also known to some as Simon Magus. So let's get right into it. How are you doing today? Great. Glad to be here, Neil. Um, and I hope that this is relevant to, to everybody. You know, Simon is one of the great mysteries and enigmas of early Christianity. Uh, some people think he's a Samaritan. Some people think he's the first Gnostic. Um, some people think he's like a pre-Christian Gnostic. And there are 10,000 theories about, you know, what his impact on early Christianity was, whether he was a Christian what he did, what community, did he start a group? Did he not start a group? Where did he go? Legend has it that he, he made it to Rome and literally flew over the city to Rome, of Rome. And yeah, uh, it's, it's a fantastic uh, story. And I'm currently writing a book or trying to write a book on Simon in which I'm going through the sources. And in the, the episode I did with you which is uh on the patreon and I, I believe part of it is also on youtube uh uh both of our channels basically I, I i introduced what's called the great declaration and this is our one of two i think of our sole surviving simonian sources that is written by an actual simonian and what i'm going to be doing today is going through the the other sources for Simon, which are like heresiological sources. And one of them, of course, is, is in the Bible, and that's the book of Acts. And I'm going to show you what we can and cannot trust in, in Acts and how that narrative was written and, and what it actually means. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So uh, a lot of this material, I should say, is, or, or I shouldn't say a lot of it, some of it is in my book, Desiring Divinity, and uh, I've got a chapter there on, on Simon. So I encourage everybody to go check that out, and uh, 
check out the the Patreon and, and my YouTube channel for for more uh, episodes and, and information on on Simon. Um, but let's uh, let's start with with what we have and just some preliminary information. So Axe, as many of you know, I don't date Axe early. And I show you why in an episode on dating acts, which is again um, both on my Patreon and on on my YouTube. Um, so I won't talk about dating the Book of Acts here, but suffice it to say that if Acts is written any time between 120 and 150, it's not necessarily our earliest source on Simon. So when you're looking in commentaries. You'll see, you know, oh, Acts is our earliest source and, you know, gives us what we can know. Not necessarily. So keep that in mind. I think it's probably a bit later than the Great Declaration. And the Great Declaration is this Simonian text, which is embedded in a book called The Refutation of All Heresies, written by a second or third generation Simonian author. In the Great Declaration, the Simon is never identified with this very distinctive term called the great power. And what the author of Acts does is he knows this great power title and he works to identify Simon with the great power. We don't know why, uh, but that's not something that's necessarily Simonian or goes back to the original Simonian thought. Much of what Acts says agrees with the account in Justin Martyr which is written in mid-2nd century Rome. And so what I'm giving here is basically the first part of a two-part series. In the second part, I'll be talking about Simon in Justin Martyr. And that part two will appear only on my Patreon. So hop on there and get the full compliment. And the link's in the description, by the way. Excellent. Yeah. So this is my... Uh, this is my translation of Acts, and uh, so it's a little bit different than what you'll find elsewhere. But I'll just go ahead and read this. Um, it's always best to to know and 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 learn the the Greek here. But I'll do my best to to just parse out the the meaning of certain words. This is the beginning of Acts, starting in in verse nine. It says, "Quote: A certain man by the name of Simon was in the city." we don't know which city, beforehand working as a magus and amazing the nation of Samaria. He claimed to be somebody great, and everyone from small to great fawned on him, claiming, quote, he is the so-called great power of God, unquote. They fawned on him because he had for a long time amazed them with the deeds of a magus. So when they believed in Philip, who preached the gospel of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and men and women were being baptized. Simon also believed and was baptized. He clung closely to Philip while observing the signs and great miracles. He was amazed. Now this section, okay, of the text, um, which I'm kind of highlighting here, is probably something that's older than the next section of the, the text. And the reason why we say that is there seems to be two traditions that the author of Acts was working with. In the first tradition, Philip, who is portrayed as a deacon, goes to the region of Samaria, which, if you've ever been to Israel, is, is basically uh, that, that kind of central hill country of Israel um, and uh, parts of it. Uh, or Palestine or, or claimed by the, the Palestinians. The ancient city of Samaria could be, uh, in, in this time, uh, Sabasti, um, which was a very Hellenic uh, city. And, uh, you know, so full of, full of Greeks, it's, it's not necessarily the case that Simon was a Samaritan that is a practitioner of the religion of Samaria. Um, that is, is not said. It's, it's also not said that he appealed only to Samaritans. Um, he appealed to the nation of Samaria, which is something broader that would include both 
um, Jews and and Gentiles. And basically, there's this story of, of, of basically Simon becoming a convert, a believer in Jesus as a result of Philip's ministry. And then you get to what seems to be a second either source or something that's invented by the author of Acts. And the reason that why I say it's uh, it's invented is because Philip, the main character in the previous bit of Acts, basically disappears and he's replaced by these apostles. And you have to ask yourself, why would the author of Acts replace Philip with the apostles? It's because the apostles, here Peter and John, are viewed as more important and their need the author of Acts needed to bring them in to authenticate the Samaritan mission. Now, whether Peter or John ever existed or ever went to Samaria, I I don't actually know. I, I don't think that we can count this, you know, plain and simple as historical. These apostles are brought in so that they can transmit what should have been already transmitted by Philip, that is the Holy Spirit. Because usually in Acts, after you baptize someone, they receive the Holy Spirit. But the odd thing about Acts 8 is when the people believe and are baptized, they they don't receive the Spirit. And there's a kind of delay. And, you know, we wait for Peter and John to journey there. And then finally, the Spirit comes. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the, read all of this, but suffice it to say Peter and John come to Samaria, and they seem to, by some kind of magical operation, transmit the Spirit by laying on their hands. And this seems to be, I say this looks like magic, because it isn't the case where, you know, the Spirit blows where it wills. It literally automatically comes when the apostles lay their hands on people. So Simon, who's seeing this, basically wants the authority and the ability to transmit the spirit in the same way. And he's portrayed as offering Peter money so that he can also apply the spirit by his own hands. And Peter basically flips out and says, you know, to hell with you and your money. (laughs) And all of this seems rather like overkill because Simon isn't portrayed as someone who is, you know, bent on destroying Christianity. He is actually a baptized Christian, and he sees this somewhat magical operation, and he simply wants to participate in the magic. And he's willing to pay for it. Um, so what we're seeing here is a theme in the, in, in the author of Acts where the author really has a problem with money and <laughs> really doesn't like the use of money for spiritual gifts. Um, Although, interestingly, you know, Simon basically killed Ananias and Sapphira because they didn't give the church the full amount of money that they promised. So there's there's lots of money issues in in Acts. Um, So, uh, yes, there's a little bit more to, to translate here. Let me just get through there. So Peter says to Simon, and here I will just just read it, because this is really important. There is no law or share for you, Simon, in this service, for your heart is not straight before God. Repent, therefore, from this vice and supplicate the Lord, if he'll forgive the supposition of your heart. For I see you in the bile of bitterness and a prisoner of injustice. Simon answers, supplicate the Lord for me that nothing happened to me as you said. Accordingly, after testifying and speaking the word of the Lord, they returned, that is the apostles, to Jerusalem, and many cities of the Samaritans were evangelized. Now, all of this, I say, looks a lot like overkill because Simon, again, is not some kind of rebel against the faith. In fact, he begs for the apostolic prayer. And what's interesting is the the apostles They never actually pray for Simon, and it's never actually said that Simon receives the Spirit. And when you look at the language here, Peter is unnecessarily harsh. Um, This language of your heart is not straight before God. Well, how does Peter know that? I mean, he's just met Simon. Um, And this language of I see you in the bile of bitterness and prisoner of injustice, this is all from the Septuagint or the the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and refers to people who are idolaters. 
And so this is really quite striking. It, it's, it's kind of like the author of Acts knows that Simon is kind of bad, but at the same time doesn't want to completely cut Simon off from the faith. He portrays Simon as a baptized Christian, okay? And it's almost as if he's looking in his own time, which is the early second century, and looking at the followers of Simon and thinking to himself, I don't really want to cut these people off. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, let's uh, let me see, we'll get past this, this page here. Lots of fancy graphics. Um, when people look at Simon, uh, they they look or they focus on this great power title. And that is the title that the people of Samaria gave to Simon was the Dynamis to Theu Megali. That is the great power of God. And I think that the author of Acts adds this participle calumeni, the so-called great power of God, because he knows that it is a title that is applied to Simon, but he doesn't really like the title. And then the question is, what does the actual title mean? Because it's not really very clear. One other thing that the author of Acts probably adds to the title is this phrase, to Theu, or of God. And the reason why scholars think that he's adding things to the title is because if you look at Mark 14, 62, where Jesus says that he will sit at the right hand of the power, Luke changes this so that Jesus sits at the right hand of the power of God, and that's the to Theu. And so probably he's adding the same thing here in Acts 8, 8 10. But we're no closer to understanding what this great power title means, even if we can say that, you know, the Sumerians were calling Simon the great power, or Dinis, Dinimus Megali, what exactly did they mean by that? It's not something, interestingly, that Simon called himself. It's something that other people called him, and it's a very special title. So let's look, um, let's look at what we can figure out. So probably the title means something like a divine being, but we don't know if the divine being is the high God or some kind of subordinate being like an angel or messenger of God. Some people say that it's a distinctly Samaritan title and because they look at 4th century Samaritan sources like Memor Marca, and they want to say that this is specifically what Samaritans use to refer to, to God. But that's not really the case. When you, when you, were, you go back to the 2nd century you, and you basically run a search on the Dynamis Megali, the great power, you'll see that it has a very wide variety of usage and all sorts of people are using this in all sorts of, of ways. It's not something, that, again, that Simon uh, applied to himself. Sometimes you'll see in the literature that Simon deified himself in, in the book of Acts, and that's just not true. It is true that Celsus, who many of you know uh, in the late second century, said that there were lots of prophets in Palestine who said, I am a god or a son of god or a divine spirit, and I have come. Wow. But does does that mean that does that mean that Simon said that? Um, we have to be very careful and cautious. That's not what the author of Acts says. If the author of Acts knew that Simon self deified himself, he probably would have would have said so. So Simon as the great power. What we know from Acts is that it's associated with the works of the Magus. Now. The author doesn't actually use the term magus. He uses a verb called uh, maguo, which is to perform the works of a, of a magus. And the magus at this time was a polyvalent term. If you remember in, in Matthew, the, the gospel, the magi, which are the, the plural of, of magus, they are viewed very positively as people who are astrologers, but they're also finding the, the baby Jesus and everything is, is hunky-dory and there's no negative word said against them. 
It can refer to a Persian priest or an independent provider of purifications and initiations. But as we go on, it more and more simply means the same thing as what the Greeks meant by a goes or a, a quack, that is a charlatan or a trickster. And when you look at um, when you look at the work of the Magus, you do find authors, you know, using it in a respectable sense. But when you look at the context of of Acts, I, I don't think that you can say that the author of Acts is using the the term uh, positively. Um, I think it's pr most people would say that. Simon looks kind of like these other magical figures that the author of Acts thinks up, perhaps invents. If you're familiar with Acts 13, Paul meets um, a magus called Elimas or Bar Jesus. And yeah, this guy ends up being blinded by Paul, um, which is, uh, you know, not very nice. And then in Acts 19, um, there's a bunch of magicians who uh, try to exercise a demon and the demon ends up overpowering them and stripping them so that they run out naked, which I guess is meant to be funny. And then they burn a bunch of magical books. So what we can see in Acts is an author who doesn't like magic. And so if Simon is being portrayed as a ma magus, that's probably not something positive. And I say this against a uh, recent work by Stephen Haar called uh, Simon Magus, the first Gnostic who tries to argue that magus actually means something positive, but I don't think that that can be sustained. So as I said, in the middle of this episode, you have Peter and John coming in. Probably this is an invention of the author of Acts. And he wants to insert this episode sort of in the middle of a narrative about Philip. Because if you remember how Acts goes, in, in Acts chapter 8, there's a a persecution and and everybody flees away from Jerusalem except the apostles and Philip goes to Samaria and then later in Acts 8 he tells the um, gospel message to the Ethiopian eunuch and in the middle of this episode on Philip the author of Acts inserts this invented episode about Peter's encounter with Simon and that doesn't appear to be based on any kind of firm tradition. It appears to be something he essentially made up out of his own head, but other scholars will disagree. Again, looking at the language here, the heart not being right or straight echoes specifically Psalm 77, 37, which talks about the rebellious or refractory attitude of ancient Israelites. They are those who rebelled even when they saw God's miracles because their heart was not right or straight with God. And when Peter talks about the bile of bitterness, this gall and bitterness are characteristic of the idolater in Deuteronomy 29, 17. So if you want to look that up in English or in Greek, if you can, uh, that that these illusions show that, you know, Simon... All, not all is well, basically, with Simon. But you have to sort of intuit that through, you know, picking up the scriptural allusions. The author of Acts doesn't come right out and, and say that. He's quite sneaky. Basically, what we have is a, is a rather ambiguous portrait where scholars kind of disagree on, you know, is, is Simon being portrayed positively or negatively? Because on the one hand, he's a baptized Christian. He's repentant. Um, but on the other hand, Peter basically, you know, verbally punches him in the face and tells him that you don't have any part as an apostle. So why do that? I, you know, there must be something going on in the time of the author of Acts. On the level of illusion, that is scriptural illusion, it's not altogether sure whether Simon receives the spirit. So, he, you know, he may be a Christian, but he may not be like a fully fledged Christian. Um, and if he is being paired with ancient rebels and idolaters, that doesn't look good for him. Now, Simon basically, I mean, he's pleading at the end of the episode, you know, and, uh, but the reader doesn't know if his heart is right. And as I said, Peter and the apostles, they don't even bother to pray for him. So the fact is, when you're reading Acts, this is a great example of an ambiguous text. You know, I mean, this is a great text where you can, you know, show to your your 
your friend or your grandmother who says, you know, scripture is always clear. This is hardly clear what uh, actually is being said about Simon. And we're left sort of a little bit uh, clueless. Uh, now, before I get to Justin Martyr, I should say the way that I would read this as a scholar is basically you do this. You this this author, the author of X, is not really writing history. This this author is writing a, a narrative that supports his particular church in the early second century. So then the question is, who is he actually writing against? Well, that would be presumably actual followers of Simon, probably in Samaria, whom the author of X didn't really like, who claimed to be Christian, but from the perspective of the author of Acts, weren't really Christian. But at the same time, he didn't want to completely cut them off. What he seems to be acknowledging in is that there was a separate Christian movement in Samaria. Its founder was, in fact, Simon of Samaria. It didn't look very much like the Christianity the author of Acts knew and loved. And so he tries to delegitimate that kind of native Sumerian uh, Christianity by showing that it's not apostolic and that Simon has no right to be an apostle. And therefore, Simonians, Simonian Christians should convert to the author of Acts' own version of Christianity. And this is a very common move that you'll see in, in heresiologists where they'll, they'll tell a story about the founder of a Christian movement in order to delegitimate that movement, which is actually something that occurs later. So there's a lot more to say, and um, I, uh, but I'll, uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll stop here just to see if uh, Neil has any questions. I do take questions um, on the Patreon. Uh, we've got a tier for that, and I, I check it every day. So if you want to hop on that, i um, happy to, to take this further with you. And also, uh, we'll have the episode on Simon and Justin Martyr there in, in a few days. Yes. I just want to remind everybody that we're going to continue this conversation and go deeper into what Justin Martyr has to say. That's on the Patreon. Links in the description. And before we get to that, my questions have to do with Acts of Peter. I know, we, I know we're focusing on Acts of the Apostles, but in this particular text, he's a full-blown magician, sorcerer, whatever you want to call him. He can fly. He's very powerful. It doesn't I don't know. Is it negative? I guess, but it also kind of gives him that power that Acts doesn't really give him. And if I'm not mistaken, it might be a different text. He's actually worshipped as sort of like a Christ figure, and he has a consort who they think is Helen Helena who's basically worshipped as Athena. Can you speak on that at all? Yep, definitely. Yeah, so as Simonian theology develops in the late second century, and I talk more about this in the book Desiring Divinity, the, the portrait of Simon develops so that basically he becomes more and more looking like a legend. So he becomes more and more of a character, if you're familiar with the Faust character in, in Guter's Faust. He's like the the great magician and arch enemy of, of Christianity, and he can he can kill people and sort of resurrect them, and he can uh, perform magic like making uh, you know uh, animals talk um, and do other sorts of tricks like he makes in the pseudo Clementine literature. He famously uh, he has a little boy. Um, do prophecies for him, and Simon can make like a homunculus, little little human, um, do tasks for him. And yeah, like in The Magician's Nephew, he can, you know, make all the pots and pans, cook a meal, and, and things like that. So as, as time goes on, you, you get this portrait of Simon, and of course in the Acts of Peter, his grand miracle is that he, he ascends to heaven, so he literally levitates and he starts flying over Rome. So it's, it's all great fun, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, um, you know, it, it's, it's more and more legend. And what we're trying to do is kind of cut back 
on the weeds a little bit, at least in, in this session, yeah. and see what we can and cannot know about the historical Simon. Right. And what's interesting is, yeah, the in, in Acts, Helen doesn't appear. Not at all. And this, and this is a this is a great question and uh, an indication of the fact that you know maybe maybe she was there, maybe she wasn't there. Uh, she's not there in the Great Declaration. Um, and she's not there in the concept of our great power, which is, uh, I think, a Simonian source in, in the Nagamati corpus. So, you know, where is Helen? There was a famous theory in the late 80s put out by Garrett Ludemann that um, the author of Acts subtly refers to Helen when he refers to, and you need, you need to know Greek in order to get this, but when Peter refers to the thought of your heart, it's apenia cardias, and apenia... Uh, is a, a name for Helen uh, in later heresiological, or, or actually it's, it's in the Great Declaration. So apenia means thought or divine thought. And later, basically the heresiologist said that Helen referred to Simon's divine thought, sort of like Athena coming out of the head of Zeus is oh, the divine thought. Wow. So she is called apenia or Enia, which is the Greek word for thought. Wow, that is deep right there. I never knew that. That is, that is because so, this now we're linking up with some ancient uh, Hesiod stuff right here with Athena coming out of the head. It's like being the forethought, the, the divine wisdom. She's given those titles like Sophia, Virgin, all that stuff. And I guess these are because now that you mention it, these are just different kinds of real Christians because it seems like something a Christian would do is give uh, attributes of divine wisdom, Sophia, Logos, those kind of things. And here we have these Simonians doing their own thing, having their own little interpretations of things, but they're doing it their way. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this is both Jewish and Christian where you have a wisdom figure and yeah. it's, it's very common. And, you know, if you can have wisdom embodied in Jesus, you can have wisdom embodied in, in a woman, too. And, of course, later Christians didn't like that, but it doesn't mean that they were right. Right, right. And um, the other, last thing I wanted to ask you about is because it, it gets kind of it's kind of interesting how you have the title Magus. Magus is sort of something you think about with Persians or Rastri and stuff, but they're Samaritans. And then we find out that they become really big in rome that's a lot of different things going on there so um what how do they get what do you think that when do they start showing up to be in great numbers in rome is it second century is it later than that well i will answer this question in the next nice. uh, episode because <laughs> it's good. only it's only justin martyr who says that they made it to rome oh and okay. I, I i think that they did make it to rome when you're in when you're in Acts, they're only in Samaria. So, yes, this is a major shift, and it, it I think it tells us something about the, the movement of the ancient Simonian Christian group. Oh. And so, I will reserve that for our next. So episode. this so this is going to be a good one then, the one on your Patreon. This is going to be because I can tell where we're going with this. We're going to get into the whole what was Simon thought of by these Roman Simonians. What, do they think he was the Christ? Do they think he was some sort of figure like Zeus? Stay tuned. Click the link in the description, and we're going to talk about all that stuff. And uh, that's it for me. Excellent. And, and you have attained true gnosis. I said in this earlier work how they, that is, the Sumerians, were misled by obeying their countryman Simon Magus, whom they say is God above all rule, authority, in power. And those of you who know uh, the book of Ephesians, you'll recognize that there's an allusion here to the episode where God raises up Christ and seats him at the right hand in heaven above all rule, authority, and power. So the question is, is Simon already being seen as Christ, or is he Christ for these Sumerians in Rome? That's the question. We actually have evidence of this statue because in 1574, the base of it was discovered. 
And to everyone's surprise, it didn't read to Simon Sacred God. It read Simone Sanko Video Sacrum, which means dedicated to the trusty Simo Sankus. Now, Simo Sankus isn't uh, a, it, well, he's not Simon, <laughs> and but he is actually a, a, a native Italic god who is was, was very old, and the Romans themselves were sort of confused about his identity, and some said that he was a, a Zeus-like character, so uh, he had a temple, or he had, his statue was nearby the temple of, of Jupiter, and specifically the Jupiter to whom you swore oaths to. Uh, some said that he was the son of Jupiter, so that's why he looked a little bit like Heracles or Hercules. 